Again, I would like to acknowledge that this event takes place on the unceded and ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. This is a fact that we hold dear, and we thank you for your generosity in allowing us to be here today and to hold this event on this land. Our format for this evening is fairly straightforward. I will soon turn things over to Ian, who will introduce our remarkable guest. Following their conversation, we will wind up the evening with a book sale and a signing in the lobby. And Marlon will be happy to sign your books after the event. Kids Books is our bookseller this evening, and we thank them very much for being here. I have a few more notes to run through before turning things over, so please bear with me. We'd like to ask you all to please turn your cell phones to silent, but do feel free to tweet all about this event afterwards. We'd like to thank our public sector funding, uh, funders this evening, the Government of Canada, the Government of BC, the BC Arts Council, the City of Vancouver, and CMHC Granville Island. And a big thank you to Penguin Random House for helping us get Marlin here this evening. Thank you goes out to our staff and our remarkable volunteers who make evenings like this possible. They work very hard, yes, indeed, <laughs> all of them. The Vancouver Writers' Fest's flagship festival will be taking place this year from October 21st until the 27th. So mark your calendars, make sure you're not out of town that week. Uh, we're very excited about that. And in the meantime, we've got a lot of other things going on. Many of you may know that we have the Insight Series, which runs at the Downtown Public Library every other Wednesday. Please check our website to see what fantastic authors and events are coming up for that. Um, and we also have special events that run throughout the year. Our special event with Zadie Smith may be sold out already. That's happening on February 28th. But we have another wonderful event happening uh, just down the road from that on March 25th with Barry Lopez in conversation with Wade Davis. Tickets for that are on sale now. So, and do check our website for all of these events. You'll find all the information you need there. Later tonight, you will be receiving a feedback form to ask you how you enjoyed tonight. Please take the time to fill that out. We do read each and every one of them. We take your suggestions to make our events better and stronger. And uh, one of you will win a festival book. We'll draw a name after receiving all of those. So please do fill it out. We really do appreciate it. And now, I'm very pleased to introduce our interviewer this evening. Ian Williams is a poet, a short story writer, a novelist, and an academic. In 2013, his poetry collection, Personals, was shortlisted for the prestigious Griffin Poetry Prize, among others. His short story collection, Not Anyone's Anything, won the Danuta Glead Literary Award for the best first collection of short fiction in Canada. And now, he's just released his first novel, Reproduction, to remarkable reviews, and I'm happy to say it is also for sale in the lobby tonight. He's an assistant professor at UBC's creative writing department and a good friend to the Vancouver Writers' Fest. Please welcome Ian Williams. Hello, good evening everyone. I've been looking forward to this for months and hopefully you have too. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce Marlon James. Marlon James is best known for his novel, A Brief History of Seven Killings, which won the 2015 Man Booker Prize. The novel also won the American Book Award, the Annisfield Wolf uh, Book Award, and the Minnesota Book Award. It was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award, and it was a New York Times notable book. A Brief History was his third novel. It came almost 10 years after his first, John Crow's Devil, 2005 which is a novel about warring preachers. His second novel, The Book of Night Women, 2009, is set on a Jamaican sugar plantation in the 18th century. It won the Dayton Literary Peace Prize for fiction and the Minnesota Book Award. And it also was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award. The book that brings him to us in Vancouver tonight is Black Leopard, Red Wolf the first of a, plan, of a planned Dark Star trilogy. It's a book that needs an introduction of its own. Critics keep searching for comparisons for it. I'll read you three of them. They describe it as, if Tarantino met Tolkien. 
if Toni Morrison had written Ovid's Metamorphosis and the literary equivalent of a Marvel Comics universe. That's Kakutani from the New York Times. The movie rights to the novel have already been sold, gobbled up by Michael B. Jordan of Black Panther fame. And this week, the novel is number four on the New York Times hardcover fiction bestseller list. And I think it's been out for two weeks. Marlon James is also a prolific pub public intellectual whose fiction and nonfiction has appeared in Esquire, Harper's, The New York Times, Granta, GQ, and the Caribbean Review of Books. He teaches at McAllister College in St. Paul, Minnesota. Please welcome Marlon James. I'm going to ask Marlon a few questions first, and then uh, he'll read, and then we'll go back to questions, and then it's your turn, right, to ask, ask questions. So my first question, mm -hmm. uh, and you're probably sick of this he by now. He was warning me before. <laughs> I'm not going to ask you that one. That's like <laughs> after. But uh, people have been calling this the African Game of Thrones, mm -hmm. and you've sort of backed away from that comment. Um, how would you describe the book? You know, to be fair, I'm the person who said it first. Yeah. <laughs> so, started it. So, um, I'm, um, I, you know, it's funny because, you know, I, I come out of media and I come out of entertainment and I mm -hmm. know how to get press to pay attention. Oh. Um, and, and I said it, I actually said it in a, in a magazine I thought nobody really read. Oh. And it turns out everybody who reads it works in media. Oh. So, it, it kind of took off to the point where Jar Jar Martin emails me. Oh. And he's like, I heard you're writing an African <laughs> version of my book. <laughs> <laughs> and he thought it was delightful, so that's great. Mm -mm. Then it's I asked him to blurb it and right. didn't hear from him. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> uh, it's, it's the first yeah. thing that people c sort of quote in, in articles. Right? Yeah, so I think because it's such, it's, it's um, again, because Game of Thrones is just so recognizable. Mm. And I think it's, um, it's, it's, an easy, it's an easy comparison to make. I, I I was I was joking earlier today that um, by now Game of Thrones fans have probably read the book <laughs> and go, this is nothing like <laughs> Game of Thrones. <laughs> so then, so how how would you describe it then? Like, how would you introduce this book? Ah, wow! I don't know, you know I'm, I'm trying to remember the, the proposal I sent to my my editor. I for me it was you know, for me it was almost more in common. It had more in common with Arabian Nights oh. than um, Game of Thrones. And um, that, to me, it's a sort of a, it was me trying to write a fantasy sort of who done it, well, why done it um, kind of novel. I mm -hmm. said I was going like, to geek the hell out on it. Yeah. And it's yeah. like kind of a African fantasy geek fest <laughs> <laughs> that, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's about, um, you know, a bunch of mercenaries who were hired to find a child and they botch it up badly and the child is dead. Mm -hmm. And people, inquiring minds want to know what happened. Right. And right. there are three witnesses and each witness's testimony is a separate book. So this mm -hmm. is the first witness testimony. Right. So it's not a trilogy in a sense of it's a part one, part two, part two, part, part, part one, part two, part three. Mm. Part two is not going to pick up where part one left off. Right. Part one finished the whole story. There's nothing left. Mm, it reinscribes itself, right? Yeah. So part two is pretty much the same story being told by a different character. Mm -hmm. And huh. yeah. So and then part three, of course, is again another version of the same of the same story. So one of the things that I think is causing a lot of anxiety. There's tons of media, tons of press about mm -hmm. this book in a very short time. And one of the things causing a lot of anxiety is this divide between literary fiction mm -hmm. and fantasy. Right. Right. Do you think? Is there a way of talking about this book without talking about genre, or do you think it's productive to sort of? Uh, I mean, work it's, produc those it's productive to a point because I'm, um, you know, it's productive to a point, I guess. Mm. But I've always found those distinctions to be bullshit. Mm. Um, my last novel, Brief History, as far as I was concerned, I was writing a crime novel, mm. um, and the biggest influence on me with that book was James Elroy. Mm. Um, when I want to remember how to write dialogue, I read, you know, I read Elmer Leonard. Right. Or Car Carl Hyacin. Um, if I want to remember that, I, you know, my characters can be as brutal as they want. I can read Patricia Highsmith. Mm -hmm. I just think, you know, 
genre is, is it's the, and it depends on the country. For example, I actually had a hard time finding a British publisher for this book. Mm. And I'm sure they're all eating crow now. I'd <laughs> love to say I'm not. <laughs> right. I'd love to be a bigger person who said, no, I don't gloat, but I'm incredibly. <laughs> I am, gloat away. Yeah. I'm an incredibly petty man. So, <laughs> but one of the publishers, we shall remain nameless, Fort Estate, um, <laughs> you know, said that it was too literary for sci-fi and too mm. sci-fi for, liter liter for literary readers, and neither will read it. Mm. Which is funny because mm. the 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 American editor and the Canadian editor said the very same thing. I go, and everybody's gonna read right. it. Right, right. They they just couldn't let go. Their 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 ideas of genre is even more rigid, mm -hmm. and which is not to say they 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 um have a low opinion of of genre fiction. They're just really into this separate but equal thing. Mm -hmm. Whereas in America, I think we pay lip service to genre, but we do have a low opinion of it. Mm -hmm. And and I always throw things out. Um, you can knock, for example, chiclet all you want. It's the only genre where women work. Right, I'm gonna ask you about that later. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, I, I read literary fiction and I sometimes go, how do these people eat? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Right. Well, yeah. yeah, they look out windows for a long time, right? Yeah, yeah. There, there's a lot of ennui. I'm like, right. somebody got to pay the bill. <laughs> um, <right>. Yeah, it's <laughs> the, when we talk about cultural appropriation and representation and all these problems we have with writers of literary fiction, I never have these problems with the crime writers. Mm -hmm. Only one writer on the wire was black. Um, so what is it that the crime writer, and I'll ask, what is it what the crime writers do or know that the literary authors don't? And the literary authors' usual response is, well, I don't read mm -hmm. those things. I said, that's why your book's dumb as shit. <laughs> so and, what, yeah, yeah. and that's why nobody believes you're a woman, mm -hmm. and nobody believes you're black people. Yeah, what do you, what do you imagine then, or what do you hope for in terms of literary fiction? Are you... Do you see that it needs to be opened up? Are you trying to open it up? Mm. Are you trying to sort of raise the profile of genre fiction? I think literary fiction is open up. I think it's already opened up. Lit fiction is? Yeah. I, I, um, I, I was at a, a, a book festival recently, and it was a phenomenon I haven't encountered in years. Mm. The white guy who only reads white guys. Huh, huh, huh. It was amazing. They all thought they were the literary avant-garde. Uh, and all they read is each other. Uh. And it was amazing because it was I was there, Edwige Dantica was there, who else was there? Rue Freeman. Mm. And we were the colored contingent, mm. the immigrant contingent, and the gay contingent all, all in, in one. one. <laughs> so everybody else got to just sort of white mail up the place. Right. And it was it was it was just it, it just hit me that nobody in this room read, has read Toni Morrison. Mm -hmm. Um, no, you know, hell, nobody in this room has read Muriel Spark. Right. And um, it's, it's, and I, but I, but I do think that kind of literature, it's, it, it says something that it was an academic campus mm -hmm. because that kind of literature lives on in a kind of academic snobbery. Right. It's the, it's the, I can never remember if it's Har Harold Bloom or Alan Bloom, one of the Blooms. Harold, yeah. Um, that kind of, the canon. Right, right. Um, kind of thing. Whereas, um, that literature is, I, don't, I just think it's not that way anymore. One right. of the, the, the weirdest parts, I don't want to dwell too long on this, but it, it illustrates my point. Um, the head of the program started to lament about when are we going to write the literature of the oppressed and when are we going to write the literature of marginalized peoples and when mm. are we, when are we going to get into the problems of the world? And I said, you know, those people are writing their own books, right? <laughs> right. You They've been write writing them for them. like 60 years now, right. if not okay. more. Right. I mean, Machado Assis is from the 19th century. <laughs> They've been writing these books. It just glazed over. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was, it was amazing. Yeah, I, I'm wondering, like, so is there going to be a point where you can write without needing to prove these things, right? Write without needing to prove that literary fiction can absorb or can uh, have elements of genre fiction, mm -hmm. genre fiction, that they can be merged or blended? Yeah. Or um, can you write without... And that's not an agenda you put on yourself. Mm. That's an yeah. agenda that's coming on from that's the That's not an agenda that I put with Peter because I really don't care. Yeah. Um, I've always had those elements in, in you know, the stuff I write. Um, 
anybody who's re really you know read my stuff really well can tell that I'm still copying X Men. <laughs> um, it's a superhero team <laughs> in the book, uh -huh. for God's sake. Well, the character is manipulated wind. I'm surprised I'm not sued. <laughs> um, I, yeah, it's just it's it's um, when it comes to mm. to to writing, I. You know, there are very few people I listen to, and it's not that I'm arrogant and I think I can write well, because mm. if I did, it wouldn't take me nine drafts to get a book right. Mm. Um, but I just don't, I don't think about those things. Right. I don't think, I think about, you know, what what makes a story, what would make mm. a story great, and what do I want to read? Mm -hmm. And because I wasn't, I just didn't grow up with that kind of snobbery. Right. I grew up reading whatever was available, and I liked them equally, and I totally resisted the whole ranking of books that would happen in, say, lit class. Mm -hmm. So if I'm reading whatever I can buy or borrow or, or steal, mm -hmm. um, hey, that's so I ended up with 100 Years of Solitude, my <laughs> life of crime. Don't knock it. <laughs> it's still it. Well, not, I didn't steal it. It was <laughs> like there, and nobody <laughs> claimed it. Right. And the cover was so pretty. Um, oh. But you know, so, but, but from, from a book like 100 Years of Solitude, the next book I'll read is, say, Hollywood Wives mm -hmm. by Jackie Collins. Right. Um, so you feel free, like your tastes are eclectic, not just in books, but in mm. movies and music and yeah. everything you feel. Uh, well, part of it too is that you just you just had to take what you can get. Right. I mean, I remember growing up, we had one TV station, so you watch whatever was on TV. Right. Um, we were just lucky that the person directing the TV had fantastic mm. taste. Mm -mm -mm. Um, you know, I'll 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 buy tons of Criterion DVDs and open and watch a film and go, but I've seen this. Mm. Um, because yes, it was one TV station, but the guy had fantastic right, taste. Right, right. I just y yeah, when you when you look at at art and and all these things as just whatever is available, let's just let's just appreciate it and mm -hmm. so on. You just you don't get you don't start ranking right. things. It's really refreshing, right? Like you genuinely sort of you're not building up this distinction between high and low and popular no. and sort of elite mm -hmm. culture. Right, you really consume whatever comes to you, and you can mm -hmm. find some something to appreciate in anything. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, you know, I remember uh, when I used to write reviews because I'd write um, reviews and it'd be sort of highbrow, and then I'd have a line. He's acted like he was being player hated, mm. and people the editor go, "What is a player hate?" <laughs> As I Google it, just go to <laughs> Urban Dictionary. Right. It's it's um, it, it's it's. I don't know if it also is part of of, of kind of being an eighties kid. Mm. And um, you know, being so submerged in pop culture, uh. while at the same time being taught what people are telling you is highbrow, mm -hmm. and um, and 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 refusing the labels and a system of ranking stuff, right? Um, because you know, I mean, I grew up a lot of stuff that was very popular was also very good. It's like listening to Prince. Mm -hmm. It's like um, TV these days, right? Lots of yeah. good sort of material in, mm -hmm. a, in a medium that's typically yeah. low, right? Yeah. So, yeah, maybe we could pause here, and mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you, like, just share something with us if yeah. you would like to read for us, and then we'll uh, go back to some questions, and I've All got right. a game for you as well. All right, I'm going <laughs> to, maybe I should run over there. That'd be good. So, I'm tempted to read either just the beginning or read a section that involves the coolest buffalo ever. I'm going to read a section with the book Cool Buffalo. <laughs> um, so, in this novel, Tracker, so Tracker's on a mission to find this child who's been gone, who's been missing for three years. And um, on, in, in, on this mission, he ends up in a sort of a team, almost like a superhero team, that he gen uh, most of them he really doesn't like and he doesn't trust. But the one character he really, really felt, one of the characters he really, really felt for, one of the people on the mission he really, really felt for was this buffalo, who is super smart. And uh, I know my, because my, my um, research assistant fell in love with him so much he kept threatening to write a spin-off book <laughs> with the buffalo. So this is how we met the buffalo, and this is them on one of their very, very first adventures. It was just to the river, but things happened. It says, 
Flying outside my window was a flag of the black sparrowhawk. My return to Congor disturbed no one. My waking earlier than, earlier than the sun caught nobody, so I went outside. The flag flew 200, maybe 300 paces away, at the top of a tower in the center of the Niembe quarter, flapping wild as if the wind was furious with it. Black sparrowhawk, seven wings. The sun was hiding behind clouds fat with rain. It was near the season, so I went outside. In the courtyard, pulling up the few shrubs from the dirt stood a buffalo. Male, brown black, body longer than one and a half of me lying flat, his horns already fused into a crown and dipping downward to curve back upward like a grand hairstyle. Except I have seen a buffalo kill three hunters and rip a lion in two. So I gave this buffalo wide space as I walked to the archway. He looked up and moved right into my way. I remembered again I needed new hatchets, not that either hatchet or knife could win against them. I did not smell urine. I was not stepping into his boundary. The buffalo did not snort and did not kick his hooves in the dirt, but he stared at me from my feet all the way to my neck, then down, then up, then down and up again, slowly annoying me. Buffaloes cannot laugh, but I would swear to the gods that he did. You should know that Tracker doesn't really have any clothes, so he stole a curtain rod and a curtain, and he's actually wearing a curtain, so he looks ridiculous. I stepped aside and walked, I stepped aside and walked, but he stepped right in my way. I moved to the other side, and so did he. He looked up and down again and again, and I would again swear to the gods, demons, and river spirits that he laughed. He came in closer and stepped back once. If he wanted to kill me, I would have been walking with the ancestors already. He came closer, hooked his horn in the curtain I wore, and pulled it off, making me spin and fall. I cursed the buffalo, but did not grab the curtain. Besides, it was early morning. Who would see me? And if anyone did see me, I could claim I was robbed by bandits as I bathed in the river. Ten paces past the arch, I looked back and saw the buffalo followed me. Here is truth. The buffalo was the greatest of companions. In Congor, even old women slept late. So the only souls on the street were those who never slept. Palm wine drunkards and masuko beer fools falling down more than they got up. My eye jumped over to their side each time, over to their side each time we passed one of them, looking at them, looking at a near naked man walking alongside a buffalo. Not the way some walked with dogs, but how men walked with men. A man flat on his back in the road turned, saw us, jumped up and ran right into a wall. The river had flooded the banks four nights before, and Congor was an island again for four moons. I marked my chest and legs with river clay, and the buffalo, lying in the grass and grazing, nodded up and down. I painted my, around my left eye, up, up to my hair and down to the cheekbone. Where are you from, good buffalo? He turned his head west and pointed with his horns up and down. West, by the Buki River? He shook his head. Beyond, in the savannah, is there good water to be had there, buffalo? He shook his head. Is that why you roam, or is there another reason? He nodded, yes. Were you called upon by that fucking witch? He shook his head. Were you called upon by Sogolan? He nodded, yes. Buffalo is all about politeness. When we were dead, he looked up and snorted. By dead, I mean not dead. I mean when Sogolan was of a mind, we were dead. She must have found others. Are you one of her others? He nodded, yes. And already you have sharp thoughts about how I should dress. I must say you are a particular buffalo. He went off into the bush, his tail whipping flies. I heard a man's heavy footsteps through the grass, 50 paces away, and sat by the banks, my feet in the river. I pulled my dagger but did not turn around. He moved closer. The cold iron of a blade touched my right shoulder. Nasty boy, how you de manage the things? He asked. They managing them fine, I said, mocking his tongue. You lost? You look like his so. That be how my look? Well, partner, you trotting round here, no robes on your person, like you mad or you a boy lover or a father fucker or what? I just washing my foot in the river. So you're looking for the boy lover's quarter? Just washing my foot in the river. For the boy lover's quarter, that be, it be weird now. 
hold that bridle. We has no boy lovers quarter around here. Eh? You sure you're talking true? Because the last time me and the boy lovers quarter, my eyes peep your father and your grandfather. He slapped the side of my head with his club. Get up, he said. At least he wasn't about to slay me without a fight. On his back, he strapped two axes, shorter than me by almost the head. My first thought was to ignore his anger and ask why he was around, since not even a wise suggler knew why seven wings assemble. He then said something to me in a thicker voice than before. That's what we're going to do with men like you, this wing said. What? Who you want me to send your head to, boy fucker? You're wrong. How am I wrong? You're wrong about me being the boy fucker. Most times it's the boys who fucking me. Hark, there was this one, best in many a moon. So tight, believe you me, I had to stuff a corn cob to ease up that hole. Then I ate the corn. Me chop off your bolo first, then your head, then throw the rest of you in the river. How you liking that? And when your parts flow down the river, people are going to say, look upon that boy fucker sugar rolling down in the river. Don't drink from the river lest you become a boy fucker too. Chop me with those axes. I've been looking for iron fine as such, forged by a wakadushu blacksmith, or did you steal them from a butcher's wife? Drop the knife. I looked at this man, not taller than a boy, confusing stout with muscular and dashing shit on my quiet morning. I dropped the dagger in my hand and the one strapped to my leg. I would love to greet this son and bid it goodbye without killing a man, I said. He laughed, pointed the club at me with his left hand and pulling an axe with his right. Maybe me should be killing you for your mad tongue and not your perverse ways, he said. He waved his axes in front of me, swir swinging and swirling them, but I did not move. The mercenary stepped forward just as a wad of something hit the back of his neck. Aunt of a donkey, he said. He swung around just as a buffalo snorted again and nose juice hit the warrior in the face. Eye to eye with the buffalo, he jumped. Before he could swing an axe, the buffalo scooped up the warrior with his horns and threw him off far into the grass. One axe landed in the field. The other came straight at me but bounced off. I cursed the buffalo. It was some time before the warrior sat up, shook his head, rose to his feet, and staggered off when the buffalo rushed him again. You took your time. I could have made bread, I said. He trotted off and slapped me with his tail as he passed. I laughed and picked up my new axes. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Tracker just kind of swag swaggers through this whole whole he book. He does, right? yeah. <laughs> Killing people. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, can you talk He's to us? He's a, a lover and a fighter. What? <laughs> that's actually, yeah, that's actually really <laughs> accurate, right? Thanks. Yeah, it's it's dropping. Thanks. What are we what are we what are we doing wrong? <laughs> okay, that's good. Now, can you talk to us a little bit about the supernatural in this book? So, mm -hmm. um, what are the limits of belief? Yeah. Buffaloes are sort of roaming with animals. Mm -hmm. Are there things that, what are the limits of belief? What wouldn't you sort of include in, in a book like this? Um, I can't imagine what I wouldn't include. Mm. The one thing that was, that was very important is that I, would, that I did not write it, uh, write it with a tourist view of the world. Mm. And I think even, and this is, this is the, mu the thing that, that trips up for me a lot of fantasy and sci-fi is that we forget that the characters, for the characters in the world, it's mm -hmm. not sci-fi. Mm -hmm. You know, for mm -hmm. the characters in the world, that is the world. And especially when it's first person, that, that person has to talk about the world as if this is natural. The familiar mm -hmm. has to be, the strange has to be familiar and the familiar is strange, that's as right. like Tony Morrison would say. Um, so that's the first thing that, mm -hmm. while I may think, you know, flying people and were werewolves and where hyenas are great, mm -hmm. they don't. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's the thing. If you render it as natural as possible, then yeah. pretty much anything works. I, you know, reading, reading, um, you know, all this stuff on African mythology and myths and legends and history was just so many things. Mm -hmm. And so many of these legends and stories challenge my view of the world and challenge my view of even morality. Because even though most of us, well, I can't say most of us, I don't know you. Mm -hmm. um, 
even though quite a few of us aren't necessarily practicing Christians, we're almost all practicing Calvinists. Mm. And we still have that, those sort of, that sort of worldview. Right. Um, so to let go of all of that, and mm. not just that, to let go of even the way in which Western legends have shaped, certainly shaped me. Mm -hmm. um, something as simple as um, in, in, in a lot of the, the African traditions, there, there is this thing called the noon of the dead. And the noon of the dead is at midnight. Mm. And the second I said midnight and I said noon of the dead, because we're Western people, a yep. whole series of, of connotations just shot off right. in your head. None of which would apply mm -hmm. in that world. Because the noon of the dead means the noon of the, means the ancestors are coming out. Mm -hmm. And you, if I remember correctly, my grandma was so much cooler than my mom. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that? So because they're just above the bullshit Should and she tell me stuff. Huh. So if I know there's a certain time of day where regardless of whatever crap I went through, I can go and hang out with grandma. Mm. That's a fantastic time of day. Mm. Where, whereas high noon was the scariest time for right. a lot of a lot of these cultures. Because the the, the 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 all the things we associate with the with midnight, the witching hour, things going bump in the night. Um, villains who show up in the dark but would cringe in the day. Mm -hmm. Like, African vampires have no problem killing you in broad daylight. Right. So just rethinking something as simple as night and day, right? Yeah. And our associations to that. Light and, and, and associations we put with both of those. Yeah. So the idea that it's high noon that you run screaming mm -hmm. and lock yourself up, mm -hmm. but midnight is cool. Yeah. And you know, your characters don't go around explaining. I like how you put mm -hmm. it, like the tourist way of, uh, of thinking of the world. They don't go yeah. around explaining... Um, what's going on. Uh, when, when students write fiction, sometimes there's a lot of world building with mm -hmm. spec fiction and a lot of uh, yeah. and fantasy. But you can't help that, especially when, especially when you're doing speculative. You do have to build the world. Right. right. You, you, but you have, to take, you have to take some risks. I think one risk you sometimes have to take is to simply just move in the world and hope the reader catches up. Mm -hmm. And also realize the reader doesn't have to catch up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you can go as detailed as you want about New York City to some of it, I just won't know and understand. And at some point, I think, I mean, the great thing about readers, the great thing about reading is that you also do the bulk of the world building. Mm. Um, you know, a writer can do a lot of things, but a writer can't make a book come alive. Yeah, they're filling in, right? Yeah. The, the reader it's a reader is. that does that. Sure. And, um, and, 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 and there are parts where it's, it's I don't know, it's a hard, I don't, I, I, you know, it's one of the hardest things I have to teach students what to not write. Right, what to omit. And yeah, what to leave alone and what you poetry is good for that. Yeah, <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> this is why I secretly <laughs> hate. This is why I secretly hate all poets. <laughs> um, you know, it's uh, yeah. What there is some level of, if not creative work, there is the the the, the job of the book coming alive. That's the reader's job. Mm -hmm. And I think with a speculative and with speculative, I actually love the idea of leaving some things up to them, because it always hit me that. Until the movie came out, if 10 million people read Lord of the Rings, that was 10 million Frodo's. Mm -hmm. Now we only have one. Right. Now Different everybody, everybody thinks Elijah Wood. Right. It's and like putting yeah. a picture of your character on the front cover of a book. Right? Yeah. You, you live yeah, there options. were millions of Harry Potters. Now we only have one. Yeah. You're right. Oh. You're right. You want to play a little bit of a game? Sure. <laughs> Why well, did right. I agree to this? So I don't even know what type of game it is yet. <laughs> so here it is. Uh, I'm just going to... Read you back to yourself, okay? Oh, Jesus. And you have to, you can explain, you can contextualize, you can clarify. You oh, good. As long as I don't have to no. identify where it came from. <laughs> no, no, you can, okay. you can retreat. Because I read from a it. lot of words. <laughs> <laughs> you do. Okay, actually, that's a good place to start. So, mm -hmm. from Vanity Fair. Mm -hmm. I've never worked from home. I've always had a separate office. I think I need separate spaces. There are too many records at home, mm -hmm. there's too much distraction. I just can't do it at all. I get, it, I get there at around 10, 11, and I write till 6. I can be in the middle of a sentence. I don't care. I stop. I'm very big on putting in a day's work. Mm -hmm. um, what do you say to yourself? What, do I say to that? <laughs> what would you say to yourself about your process here? Oh, I'm saying, good on you. <laughs> I... Is this true? But it's like true. Actually? It still is. It still is true. It's, it's funny because uh, nearly every house I've lived in, every house I've rented has had a fully functional office that has never been used. Huh. 
Like my office now, it has it has a Mac, it has a printer, it has a scanner, <laughs> it has two desks, three chairs, it, and tons of cobwebs. Right. I have never. I just can't work from home. Uh. Um, because you know my home is where I have everything that excites me about you know enjoying my life. So mm. I come home, I want to play music. Right. And, and and so on. So I've always. I'm the person who will leave my home office and, and you know, find a cafe somewhere and write. And that's how I wrote Brief History. I wrote it right. in nearly every cafe in Minneapolis. Different character for every cafe? or Sometimes. <laughs> um, <laughs> you like a big cast, too, yeah. right? You, you do. Yeah. So for oh. this book, um, yeah, I did have an office. Mm-hmm. And, um, and to me, when I write, I go to work. I, I'm, I'm amazed when people say things that they write when they're inspired. I'm like, wow. Right. So you really keep these hours? Like you yeah, pretty much I go do 10 keep them. Yeah, I, I do keep normal work hours. I get there at like 10, 11, and I work, and I have a lunch break, and, and I stop at wow. 6, and I don't take work home. Wow, that's admirable. I love, because I love to not write. Mm. Um, you know, and, and that's what I'm saying. So And, and, and to me, my, one of my creative writing teachers, Nancy McKinley, once says, if you set a routine, the muses will show up. Mm-hmm. And I believe her. Right. Because when people said things about they write when they're inspired, I'm like, man, I've been inspired since the first <laughs> George Bush administration. <laughs> right. I was like, I'll how give do you, you do it? I'm going to give you another one, okay? Uh-huh. This is a Lit Hub article uh, about your mother. Mm-hmm. Um, this is a bargain that I still see women make, including friends who are not friends anymore. Mm-hmm. Now that I'm a married woman, my life is husband and family. Friends fade. This was something of that woman of her time were told to buy into, that friendship was something to hide, to bide the time until you found your true purpose as wife and mother. Mm-hmm. Happiness was something you provided for your children, not yourself. Mm-hmm. What were your thoughts on your and son? My mom was on the cusp of that, which is, is um, both kind of great and both kind of sad mm. in the sense that she was a career woman. So and already she was radically different from her parents and her grandparents. Um, and my mom was like, you know, my mom was like the first woman cop to be made detective in Jamaica. She's mm. kind of a badass. <laughs> um, but she still bought into the idea that um, now that I'm married, my life is husband, career, and children. Mm. And friends got let go. And the problem, with, and, and the thing is, now I'm, I'm watching her in, her in her 80s. You know, the husband, is, the husband has died. Mm. The children have left the nest. And she's retired. Mm. So mm. what do you have left? Right. Um, and I think, and, and, I, and I, you know, and, and I do see it. And I see, still see it with, with their friends of mine who are not friends because they're like, well, you know, friendship was something from my 20s. And, and, right. and, and you know, particularly women friends. And, and, and um, it's just something, it's just considered a thing to give up. So you still think it's true of this generation? Women's think, happiness is determined I, by family? And I, 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 I mean... Not as much as, say, my mother's generation, but I do think yeah. people underestimate the value of friendships mm-hmm. and the value of friends. I think what the thing that keeps me normal is I have a whole posse of friends who are so not impressed with me. <laughs> they don't read my books. <laughs> they only know about me when somebody tell yeah. them. They'll go, you know, my boss likes your book. <laughs> they, are, yeah. they are so incapable of That's being good. interested. How about your family? Yeah? How about your family? With oh, same thing. Actually, my brother is reading my book now, and he's so excited. He's like, this is your first book that I'm reading. <laughs> that's good. I was like, I have that's four. Good. Uh, that's good. <laughs> that's good. I'll give you another. Mm-hmm. How about this one? Just two words from the New York Times. Narratively promiscuous. <laughs> <laughs> I almost spat out. <laughs> um, What's that about? But I, that, that goes back to what I'm saying, that I read widely, and I read without discriminating, and mm. I will read anything. Um, right now I'm reading, I'm reading Jane Eyre because I've read it in years. Oh. That book is so goth. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot that <laughs> thing. I feel like I need to put on corpse paint. Yeah. <laughs> it's so goth. Oh. Um, I'm reading that, but I'm also reading um, Hellboy in Hell because Hellboy has finally made it to hell, and I'm very excited. Mm, mm. Um, what else am I reading? I just read The Perfect Nanny, mm. which is oh. funny because. <laughs> There's a kind of reader who buys a book called The Perfect Nanny, <laughs> and then they open that <laughs> book, and, they and they're so <laughs> horrified by the very first right, paragraph. Right. right. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, you know, Francine de Plessis Grace said, resist the tyranny of genre. Mm-hmm. 
And I've always believed that. And not even realizing that I, you know, that yeah. I did. So, yeah. But narratively promiscuous may be that I, I fall in love with supporting characters all the time. Uh -huh. And they sometimes, sometimes they end up taking over the book. He didn't take over with this one. Right. Because I really fell for the leopard, the black leopard in the book. I, I felt hard for him. Like, you are exactly the type of person nobody should date. Yeah, it shows, right? There's a real yeah. obsession all the way throughout the book, right? Mm. Um, yeah, that's a great thread. He is, he is so not boyfriend material. Uh, always? Throughout the whole book? Or you think that's Ooh. just a conclusion Ooh, towards the end? Yeah. Oh, no, through the whole book. He's like, yeah, you can't date a cat. <laughs> you, just, you just can't. You can't date a cat. In human form, maybe. No, like a, no. uh, <laughs> maybe one more, and then I'll turn it over to the audience. Mm -hmm. Uh, we've talked about genre, so I'll skip this one. Mm. Hmm. Mm. Uh, yeah, let's do this one, okay? <laughs> this is from The Observer. It came out what, just a couple of days ago. Mm -hmm. With writing, you have to remember that characters are human, and humans surprise and humans disappoint, says James. Mm -hmm. I write men who fail the expectations put on them. I think masculinity is an expectation, and it's a role, and it's a way, and in a way, it's drag. It's mm. a drag, you said here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, masculinity is a drag. It's, well, uh. it is drag. It is performance. Uh. It's as fake as anything else. <laughs> it's um, certainly in a way in which I grew up, where masculinity was a performance, mm. where sometimes in Jamaica, having one girlfriend meant you were gay. Mm. Um, yeah. I remember when... Um, you mean at a time or ever? Ever. <laughs> so I remember... So one of the biggest gunmen in Jamaica, his name is, is Zeke's. And Zeke's... So Zeke's has been gay for years, mm -hmm. right? And Zeke's style, of, Zeke's style is he gets blowjobs from people and kill them. So he's also a serial killer. Wow. And uh, so Zeke's finally gets caught and finally ends up in a court date because they found his DNA in one of his victims' mouths. Wow. Zeke's has a press conference, not to prove he's innocent. He's fine with being guilty. He had a press conference to prove he's straight. <sighs> he's like, I have dozens of baby on the street. Clearly, I'm wow. straight. I'm like, dude, everybody wow. knows you're the biggest cocksucker in Kingston. Wow. And that's masculinity and performance. It's there, performance. Right? It's it's um, it, mm. which is not. To, I do think there's such a thing as masculinity. Yeah. Um, but I do think a lot of it is performance. Uh, you know, people, people, um, it's funny how, how the backlash sometimes men have against the term toxic masculinity. As I, but every men's magazine in existence yeah. is there to fight toxic masculinity. They're mm. like, how can I not be a cad? How to not yeah. sleep around? How to be irresponsible? That's, that's the whole purpose to men's health. Right. Are you tired yep. of that term, though? Toxic huh? masculinity? Are you tired of it? Or you feel like it's actually. Still doing work. Well, people need to stop being toxic. They're not <laughs> tired of it. Um, it's 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 Fair. yeah. It's um, I I I see too much too much. There's too much of it of of masculinity, um, which I think is a totally different thing from maleness. Mm -hmm. um, you know that is yeah. It's a set of social. It's yeah. a set of social circumstances. It's a set mm -hmm. of social con conventions rather. Mm. Um, Do you find yourself playing it? Oh God! I hope not. I wear dresses all the time. Um, <laughs> I've been calling it a tunic, right? Like in that's the true, because <laughs> that's butch. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, because but I'm still a product of this society, and um, and and uh, you know. But I, I really hope that's some one of the things that we start to just you know tear down. I mm. think. Yeah. Mm -mm -mm -mm. This book is tearing it down. <laughs> right when you consider how how the fluidity with the, how men interact with yeah, each other. Yeah, it's it's you know in um, Africa gets a lot of rap right now for for homophobia in countries like Uganda mm. and Nigeria. And one of the things we don't realize is how invented that homophobia is. Mm. That um, that to me was one of the joys of this research was just finding how much queerness was in Africa mm. and non-binariness. And that um, you know, I remember once I interviewed Chimamanda Adichie. She's going to be here. Yeah? Yeah, in a few months. Oh, God, she rocks. <laughs> um, and I remember she was talking about, you know, when she was growing up, everybody knew of the two aunts at the end of the street. Right. Uh, everybody knew of the two uncles mm. Um, mm. or the brothers who don't look alike. <laughs> everybody knew. And everybody knew that even if they're not people you readily invite to the party, everybody knew if they were to vanish, the town would fall apart. Right, right. 
Um, and my friend Lola Shonyin, another Nigerian novelist, is, you know, when somebody asks her if, if Africa would ever be ready to accept gay rights and so on, she said Africa was born ready hmm. until a bunch of TV preachers told them that they weren't. Hmm. And, I think, and I think that, you know, that is, is what's happened. Right. And the book talks about a time before this, mm -hmm. right, before the intervention of Christianity. Yeah. All right. Let's, I'm going to turn to the audience here. Um, please couch your questions as questions. <laughs> Not a <laughs> to comment. State, to state the obvious. Not a 15-minute comment with a one-second right. question. Afterwards, you can you can do all <laughs> that with him privately afterwards, but mm -hmm. be mindful of the uh, others around you and, and his time. So who'd like to go first? Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what what would you say? Mm -hmm. Right. So I'll just repeat the question for the benefit of the recording and for, for others there. So with regard to the second your second book, um you're curious about how um sort of uh what works he's encountered to sort of deal with Decolonization. Decolonization. Yeah. I, th I, yeah, I can read it as like what type of works that spoke to me that I thought this is me and this this speaks to me. It, it, believe it or not, so many of those works weren't even Jamaican. Hmm. Um, the first work where I recognized myself was Jessica Hagedon's Dog Eaters. And this is a novel set in the Philippines. And I met her. I said, this is the best novel about Jamaica I've ever read. <laughs> and it's set in the Philippines. It, it gets the crazy, because if you're in Manila, or if you're in Cape Town, or if you're in Kingston, or if you're in Maracaibo, um, you, 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 the second I land in Cape Town, I go, oh yeah, I know this. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and I can't be conned in Cape Town, because I'm uh -huh. like, no, I know your hustle, I know this. Um, yes. One of the things, uh, it, it, Mexico City, I land right. there and go, oh, I know this. Yeah. I think the, the, mm. it, it's, she catches the craziness, she catches the way... The, the malignant way in which politics insinuates everything. And if nothing else, she knows that in these cities, we're always, we always are hovering between a political election and a beauty contest. <laughs> <laughs> and when I saw that, I'm like, oh my God, this is Kingston, Jamaica. Um, so definitely uh, a book like Jessica Hagenon's, like, like Dog Eaters. Um, books like Master Tyranny and Desire, which was about um, Thomas Thistlewood, that overseer in Jamaica, who I, you know, developed such a hatred for, I had to put him in my book just to have somebody punch him. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, it's, it's, you know, Tony Morrison's Sula. Um, you know, Sula, mm. I mean, Sula validated my life in ways I didn't know it needed to be validated. Mm. You know, when Sula said, when, when um, Nell um, says to a dying Sula, you know, what do you have to show for your life? And Sula says, show to who? <laughs> And I was like, it never mm. hit me. I was like, I, it never hit me that I can live my life without their, not for the approval of people who may never approve me. It just, it just never occurred to me. Mm. And then I read Sula, and it did. And honestly, mm. if I talk about Sula more, I'll probably start crying. Mm. Um, but it did. So it's, it, was a, it was a really a wide range of books. Olive Senior's Summer Lightning, um, you know, a, a Jamaican collection of, of short stories. Um, I mean, I could go on. That could be my. That could have been my talk. Hmm. Um, but yeah, but I, hmm. those are the ones that come straight to mind. That it's not. That is sometimes it's books that coming from way across the other side of the world, mm -hmm. and it just hit me like this is the vision of myself I needed to see. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Other you. questions? <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. God, how did so, it? Uh, so it's a question about representing drugs and addiction in a brief history of seven killings, and you want to know how did Marlon mm. get so close to the bone there? Um, no, I, I did yeah. not. I did not consume any controlled substances <laughs> while writing that book. There's none that I remember. A little caveat there. I, you know, I am. Um, a lot of the skills I learned from writing, I didn't learn in creative writing class. I actually learned from journalists. Mm. And I'm a big believer that fiction writers should take a journalism course and so on. I just ask people. I talk to so many addicts. I talk to addicts. I talk to mm. present-day addicts. I talk to drug dealers. I just was not shy. Mm. Um, you know, even some things like I, somebody's like, okay, I need to know the difference between a heroin high and a cocaine high. Um, you know, which is the one that makes you feel like you must have sex, which is the other one that actually means you can't have sex, which is a so on and, and, and so on. And, and I just ask, I just ask um, as many questions as I, as I could. And, um, and I think the rest is a kind of, you make this leap of empathy, I think, because mm. uh, I certainly wasn't going to try heroin. <laughs> or an, or an angel does, but yeah, it's it's asking people. But I will, you know, what I I also ask almost to the point of being invasive questions because I need to know. Um, I keep thinking, man, I really hope Homeland Security is no longer watching my computer because <laughs> the stuff I research, <laughs> the stuff I research is is crazy. But yeah, and the rest of it is asking and knowing, and then sometimes just making a leap of empathy. No, those I get by reading women. Hmm. Um, yeah, because uh, I remember um, years, years, years ago, um, uh, you know, I, I remember which novel it was, and Elizabeth Nunes, the, the Trinidadian novelist, said, you know, you're a pretty good writer, but you don't have a clue about women. Hmm. And I was like, what are you talking about? I have a mother. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I know women folk. <laughs> And, uh, but then she asked a question which I sure will stump 90% of the male writers. She asked, how many women have you read? Mm. And I realized all the women I read are dead. Mm. And she said, that's your problem. You don't read women. And, and I don't think you can write women if you don't read women. Oh, that's beautiful. You know, you just, you, yeah. And she, she's a person who may marry Toni Morrison, mm. which changed my life. Um, Toni Morrison and Iris Murdoch and Muriel Spark and Alice Walker and... Kathy Acker and, and 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 just women from all over the spectrum and 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 um, and understanding writing female characters, you have to read how people write female characters, and that's how I mean that's how that happened. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Another question? Yes. Here. <laughs> mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's a question about a uh, understanding African spirituality and, and uh, uh, mysticism on its own terms instead of through the lens of Catholicism or Christianity. Mm -hmm. uh, well, first, uh, 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 to, to talk about the Caribbean context for, for a second, um, a lot of that I, I, I knew, like um, not just from because I have really, really close friends who are Santeras, and that there is, there are just some things that old Massa couldn't whip away. Um, you know, and it's not just like Obia or Mayal or Voodoo, Vodona or all these things, which I know quite a bit about. Um, you know, our folklore like Sukuyan and, and Rolling Calf and all of that. But I actually wasn't interested in diaspora mythology. 
Um, I or I wasn't only interested in that. I really wanted to go further back and 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 things like Bultungi and 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 Yumbo and you know and Eloko and all these things. The the I I wanted the 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 mythologies and the legends and the histories and the religions that I didn't know. Um, because I was going back to a period before pre-Christian, pre-Islam, that type of time in, in sub-Saharan Africa, which meant a lot of, you know, a lot of research and not a lot of depending on how I interpreted them here. Cause, um, it would be, it would have been very easy for me to write that kind of book, but then that's an American book. Or that's an African book through an American gaze or a diaspora gaze. And, and yes, I could have written that book, and I think that book actually should be written. But it was written. That's what, that's what Gabriel Garcia Marquez does. Mm. Um, you know, uh, so I, 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 to me, a lot of that book, that type of book has been written, including me, me, I wrote one or two of them. I really wanted to go back to the mythologies I didn't know. And it's a fact to, I had to, you know, I had to go and learn. And um, and that set me in that that um, put, you know I had to think of different wavelengths and even a different cap kind of worldview and a different type of cosmologies and and all those things to write this book because I had to write the book from the point of view of characters who take these things for granted. It goes back to what I was saying about I couldn't write it like a tourist. I couldn't be a spiritual tourist either. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's why it took me two years of of you know researching all of that. Some of them I stayed away from. I resisted, and I think I stayed away from like having Orishas in the book, largely because um, Orishas are still being worshipped and Orishas are mm -hmm. still being taken seriously. And to me, to put Orishas in the book, it would be like it'd be like me writing Lord of the Rings, and instead of Gandalf, it's it's Jesus. And and I wasn't I wasn't gonna you know, take, you know, living gods and make them comic characters. Mm. Um, so that I, I, you know, I was very careful to stay away, um, stay away from that. But I'm still hugely inspired by that, those, that, cosmo those, that cosmology, that universe, that there are beings in the sky and beings in the sea and, and, um, and that that kind of sort of supernatural is actually, I have to write it as the supernatural is natural. But yeah, I had to. I did have to let go of the sort of the diasporic um, kind of elements, despite them being clearly from Africa. Yeah. So we have time back. for like a couple more. That was way at the top, waving. Yes. Thank you. So a quick summary of that. So um, the speaker here uh, grew up in Jamaica and is talking about homosexuality in Jamaica and the homophobia mm -hmm. and unable to sort of uh, see it until uh, leaving the country and wants to know how Marlon mm. was able to sort of write from the outside mm -hmm. um, uh, about yeah. homophobia in Jamaica. I, honestly, I did what you did because even as a gay person, being in Jamaica, I couldn't see it with three, three dimensionally either. I couldn't see it with any sort of three dimensionality either. Um, and, and it's, it's getting, it's, it's 
leaving the country and gaining perspective that allowed me to write it. Mm-hmm. The one thing I have to say here, which is very important, um, you know, I've talked to Jamaicans, a, a Jamaican friend of mine is just eight years younger than me. He read um, books and he read an essay I wrote in the New York Times where I kind of came out. And says, I got to tell you, I didn't recognize that Jamaica you're talking about. Mm. Um, that for, and I've, I, you know, I remember going back, going back um, to a university of West Indies and meeting their, their gay students association, the queer, queer association. And I had my It Gets Better speech mm. ready to give. And you're like, we don't want to hear that shit. Do you know Beyonce? <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> it was this whole new generation of, of still kids who are refusing to give up childhood and teenage dumb. They want... They want it. They want the, the they want the bad relationship. They want the huge crush. They want to worry only about Beyonce versus Rihanna. They're not gonna yeah, you know, and they right. refuse to give that up. But I for but I yeah, like you, I think I needed the perspective to even bring some sort of humanity to how that homophobia works. Mm. Because it it, it 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 it's it's too easy to take, for example, the the view that a lot of people who visit Jamaica have. So when people said to me, even now, what's it like growing up in the most homophobic nation on earth? As I I had no idea Jamaica was spelled R U S S I A. Because because I don't feel scared in 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 Jamaica. I lose my shit in Russia. Hmm. Um, you know, so it's 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 recognizing also that it's complicated was something I had I needed perspective. Mm-hmm. And I think I needed to leave here to get a three-dimensional view. I don't think a lot of people younger than me have to, but I know for me I needed I needed to do that. Mm-hmm. And it's not just the, the and I, and looking back at brief history, it's not just the content that it affected. It's also the form that those sections of the book are actually the loosest writing I've ever written. It's the most carefree writing I've ever written because I think I needed uh, I, can't Im- I, 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 can't, I can't imagine how I would have written those scenes if I was living in Jamaica I can, actually I know how I would have written them they would have been more they would have been very stilted they would have been they would literally speak a kind of repression I think mm. so even the, even the form of which I wrote those scenes I think I needed to leave to do it but I also recognize that there's a whole new generation of Jamaicans who they don't mm. yeah Maybe one final question, last question. Yes, I'll send it right here. Um, he was asking with um, the, the recent award winning trilogy of N.K. Jemison for an exciting time for black sci fi and sci fi readers. Um, yeah, but it's, it has been for a while. I mean, it's, 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 it's N.K. Jemison, it's Nnedi Okora for. Um, I hope people start reading, more people rather start reading Sophia Samatar and Kaya Shanti Wilson because they are both pretty fantastic and they've been very fantastic in focusing on fantasy because I think sci-fi is pretty well represented. Fantasy, um, mm-hmm. a lot of people are still, you know, um, working on. You, you can't ignore, I, I, I don't think, I was, go- I was, I was going to try to get to the end of one panel without bringing up Black Panther. But since somebody mentioned Michael P. Jordan anyway, <laughs> and I really get off on telling people, yeah, Killmonger bought the book. Um, you know, Black Panther, Black Lightning, Luke Cage, and, and so on. Um, you know, these elements are always around, and these stories are always around. I think there is a new attention, and I think um, this is one of the situations where things like social media actually do good things. In that um, the, before, a lot of this would have just been considered niche and just put off somewhere. And, and, and niches are great, but it's, it's, it robs people double, twice the time. Cause only a few people get to read it and, and the rest you know, miss out. And there's some really, really fantastic work that was been going on. Um, you know, Charles Saunders did the Imro trilogy from way back in, I think it was the 70s. So it's, it, it, those works are always, you know, were always there. Um, what I hope is that it, it's, it doesn't, people look at it as a moment you know, as opposed to something that's a paradigm shift and people are reading it, meaning that um, it's, you know, writers like N.K. Jefferson and so on are having more white readers than ever before, um, which prove a point which I always thought was that everybody wants to read these stories. It's usually the gatekeepers and the marketers who think they don't. Mm. 
And and I think that's what we need to sort of you know sort of of look at. I'm amazed at the people who who read this book um, because I still come out of, the, of of an industry that told me that you know these audiences are you know are limited. I think everybody wants a great story, mm. and everybody wants. I think everybody wants something sort of fresh, and I think everybody's drawn to you know to newness. So I hope it's. Uh, I think it's it's more than more than a moment. At least I hope it is. And I think more and more people are reading these stories. And I think more and more people are broadening the idea of what they want stories to do. Um, I couldn't tell the last time somebody come up with, with things like, I need to relate or identify the story, which is two of the dumbest things ever said about literature. Uh, can you imagine if everybody else in the world thought that? <laughs> I can't imagine being in Jamaica and going, well, no, I don't relate to Indiana Jones. <laughs> 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 I just recognize a great story right. and I like a good yarn like everybody else. And I think that it's almost it's almost going back to a simpler type of idea of pleasure. We just want a good yarn. We just want mm. a good story. Mm. And I think that's it. And I hope it I really hope it continues. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Wow. Thank you, Mar <laughs> thank you, Marlon. Thank you guys. And thanks for coming out. <laughs> so uh, thank you, Marlon. Thank you, mm. Vancouver Writers Fest. So I think I'm signing books somewhere. Yep, there are books outside. Marlon's available to sign uh, books. Uh, so just out uh, in the foyer here in the lobby. Mm -hmm. um, and he'll be out shortly. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone. See you outside. Thank you.